I'm David Levi Strauss, chair of the MFA program in art writing here at the School of Visual Arts, and this is uh, one of our Quixote talks. Um, I just wanted to say that on December 7th, we have Susan Bernofsky coming to talk about the Swiss German writer Robert Walzer. She's the, a translator of Walzer, and she's finishing up a biography of Walzer. Um, so December 7th, 6.30, 6.30-ish, uh, on Thursday night, December 7th. So um, tonight we have Alex Fatal, and uh, Mick Tausig will introduce Alex. Alex is going to talk for about five minutes before the film, show the film, which is 29 minutes, and then uh, he'll talk a bit more, and then I'll have a conversation with him. Uh, I only met Alex uh, face to face uh, this end of this summer in Bogota, and I'd heard about the film from him, I guess. Um, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm still mystified as to how it's filmed in the back of a truck, uh, the back being a, a, a pinhole camera. So I have yet to see, but the, 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 the story he related to me uh, pertains very uh, much to my own uh, years in the Putumayo, which is in the Ecuadorian Colombian border, lowlands, um, the foothills of the Andes. Um, I was there from, what, 75 to into 2000, uh, on and off, just about every year. And he has an amazing story to tell, uh, which you'll, he'll tell you, and you'll see it, first of all, in the film. Alex uh, has uh, first went to Colombia, when it, the country Colombia, uh, in 2001 on a Fulbright, comparing, he just told me, uh, the idea was to compare the photographs made by Colombian photographers with uh, non-Colombian uh, photographers. Uh, so he has a long-standing interest in photographic image and cinema, and um, I'll leave... I'm glad that he's come uh, so that I can see the film. I have a, uh, a couple of very particular interests I won't go into right now, come up in conversation. We're very pleased that you came. Well, thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you for the, the invitation, Mick, and uh, for everybody who's made this possible. Um, I don't have a lot to say about the film in advance other than it's a work in progress, and uh, I was reluctant to show it publicly in its state. Um, but I'm hopeful, especially with this audience, that I'll, I'll get some good ideas uh, as I go down the stretch. I'm going to shoot a little bit more with the truck uh, in January and then release it into the world later in 2018. Uh, so your comments will come at an opportune time. I'm looking to distill it down even further. Uh, it's a portrait. It's an intimate portrait in a psychoanalytic oniric confessional space. Um, I look forward to the discussion. I look forward to your comments. And uh, yeah, let's watch the film. A mí, cuando recién me retiré por allá, unos sitios me hicieron un trabajo, como un ligamiento en el cuerpo mío para que no me encuentren que no me busquen, para que se olviden de mí. Porque de momento que uno entra, no sabe usted a qué es que se fue allá. Entra es como por ir a conocer o ir a ver qué... como por una experiencia. Porque usted entra y no sabe ni qué es lo que está haciendo. Yo sinceramente no voy a hablar mal de, del movimiento, porque es que eso fue una escuela para mí. Porque, digamos, yo cuando era chino yo tuve una vida muy, muy pesada, ¿sí me entiendes? Y allá llego y como que encuentro un refugio. Encuentro como esa familia que, que no tuve. O sea, hubo un tiempo en que, en que empecé a soñarme con el diablo, ¿no? El diablo es lo, o sea, todo era a quererme cargar, a quererme llevarme y yo a no dejarme. Y una vez se mete como en el cuento como que si estuviera, como que así es real. Y a veces entre el sueño uno a veces 
le pegan un tiro o un algo, se les pega el brinco. Usted queda como con eso en la cabeza, será que nos van a saltar, será que una cosa y otra. Y de ahí para allá casi usted no puede dormir. Les voy a resumir a, a, en pocas cosas. Yo tuve un curso de pistolero. Y el que recibe un curso de pistolero no es nada, o sea, no lo recibe para nada bueno. Eso es todo. Well, I found it uh, absolutely fabulous, uh, the movement of the truck and the landscape behind it uh, correlated with, co-occurring with the uh, man's story. I mean, it's uh, totally spellbinding. Um, you know, I know the scenery, I know the landscapes uh, pretty well, and uh, to me it was so strong to see those towns, to see those mountains, to see the, the foliage. Uh, and this moving screen behind the, behind the speaker uh, is like a, sets up a, a sort of a rhythm or um, even something like a music in which the storyteller is unreeling uh, his, his memories. Uh, at certain times, the background uh, is um, it corresponds to the verticality that I know. Uh, there's a top and a bottom. Uh, other times, it's upside down. And I wondered if you could talk, uh, if you could explain in, in uh, uh, slowly and in some detail how this uh, sort of uh, uh, camera um, uh, obscura, uh, obscura uh, uh, is working. Uh, so I get a better, everybody gets a better idea of where's the camera, what's the truck doing, uh, how many times uh, did you uh, stop and start, how much editing is involved, because it looks like one continuous journey more or less, which is uh, uh, assisted uh, greatly by the fact that the truck keeps going, the sound of the truck, the vibrations and so forth. But I see very many different landscapes that are involved, so there must have been, you must have been driving, someone was driving that truck <laughs> in a lot of, a lot of uh, kilometers. Uh, so maybe uh, tell us a little bit about the actual, uh, the, f the setup. <coughs> sure, I mean, sometimes when I show the, show the, footage, people have a misconception about how it was recorded. Um, so maybe I'll do a straw poll and ask how many people here think that what what was projected behind uh, Alex, the guy, the guy's name is also Alex, uh, was a was a projection of some sort. Okay, anybody want to, what is your name? Me? Yeah. Sahal. 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 Anybody, who agrees with Sahal that this was like a, a video projection? Like post production? Like just the camera obscura effect of the aperture in the wall. Yeah, right, okay. So essentially what, I, what I've done in the back of this, the payload of this truck is I've, I've opened a five centimeter hole on one side and I've draped a white cloth on the other. Um, and to focus the image, I went to an eyeglass shop and um, t told them that I have an aperture of five centimeters and that I have a focal distance of two and a half meters. And with that, they created a lens that I taped onto the hole. Uh, and we would drive around, and what you see behind Alex is uh, the landscape outside of the truck uh, projected upside down and reverse. So you, you <laughs> we focus on the fact that it's upside down, but it's also uh, 
horizontally inverted as well. Yes, yeah, and that we we that becomes particularly apparent in, in the end. Um, so you know, one of the challenges in the editing is um, this is, this novel construction. Uh, the novelty wears off. Uh, so how to maintain attention, uh, maintain a, a kind of element of surprise over the course of the trajectory. So what we chose to do is invert certain landscapes. When it's just, just landscape shots, for the most part, we've, in post-production, flipped them right side up. It's a good question, and it's come up in the editing because, you know, it's an experimental documentary. Uh, it's, it's, so the question comes up, you know, how faithful do we want to keep ourselves to some documentary ethos? Um, and in the end, we've settled on not entirely faithful, but um, at the same time, we want... Uh, there's, there's something about the co-presence, there's something about the simultaneity uh, of recording in the truck, in that space, with that clangor, um, that I think is very productive, that, that wouldn't have been... A, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to replicate in post-production. I think it's inc I think it's quite incredible. I mean, it, a straight interview with someone with a camera on them would be um, um, f an incredibly weaker film, in my opinion. Uh, one thing is to talk about technique, technology, the the lens, and so forth, which creates this uh, sort of magic. Uh, another thing, of course, is the uh, extraordinary story the man has to tell, which, in a way, is uh, supplants everything. Um, did you meet many people that you wanted to film, or did, uh, did you? It was just uh, this Alex, and you decided I'll make a film about him. Yeah, I recorded with eight people, um, and initially I was thinking that this would be a kind of a narrative done in multiple voices, and and different people would tell different parts of the kind of common trajectory that they share of of joining the guerrilla. Uh, a difficult childhood, generally, uh, you know, the tr the travails within the guerrilla, uh, the the very difficult decision uh, to leave, uh, then facing the new challenges of, in the city, being kind of betwixt and between uh, guerrilla and civilian life, a guerrilla past and a civilian present, uh, and and in the truck, uh, these distinctions really fall away. And that's what I've, I've found in, in speaking to many former combatants that a lot of these distinctions really don't hold. But, you know, some of the other people had really wonderful um, anecdotes and pieces of the story that um, I wanted to include, but they'll have to go in some other piece. For example, uh, this one fellow says the first time he does Jahe after he was a civilian, um, he, he vomited. Uh, and in his vomit, he saw... Uh, rifles, munitions, uh, hammers. He says, I, I vomited an entire hardware store. Um, and so, so some really poignant pieces. But in terms of uh, one character that would have uh, a kind of arc and a, a journey, um, I, I think Alex's story was, was extraordinary. So I cho just cho chose the one person. Uh, your own um, PhD uh, fieldwork, and which you've finished and got your thesis and turning it into a book, concerns the attempts by the Colombian army to mount a uh, recruitment campaign to get uh, FARC fighters to desert, uh, which is what he did. And his experience having deserted was that his life suddenly became very difficult for com for completely different reasons, that he was a marked person and the FARC, his fear is that the FARC would kill him. Do you see this film in some ways working against the recruitment campaign uh, that you studied? And you also told me that the Colombian army had a contract with McCann Erickson, uh, a Madison Avenue firm. And uh, I was wondering whether in fact um, American companies or international PR firms have been um, busy in creating a view of the FARC which is uh, completely noir 
and uh, we hear very little about the paramilitaries. Do you think there's been a, uh, not just what you studied, but do you think there's been a larger campaign, both in this country and in Colombia, to divert attention from paramilitaries? Uh, yeah, I mean, in, in the battle of images and um, just the propaganda war, the, the military and the paramilitaries have been better equipped. Uh, another anthropologist that uh, we both know, Win Winifred Tate, has worked on the kind of PR, PR apparatus of the paramilitaries. Um, so, yeah, now, now the conditions have changed, of course, because there's been a peace agreement and uh, the FARC can pick up a microphone. They, they can upload videos uh, to YouTube without them being taken down. And the FARC can... can for once, uh, speak for itself. I was actually at the, uh, there was a, a Supreme Court ruling in, in Denmark with a, a Danish group that was funneling money to uh, the FARC and the PLF, PFLP to try to uh, challenge EU anti-terror laws. And uh, even the, the Danish courts came down on the side of, of saying that this was illegal, that um, this type of international solidarity was illegal. So by, by cut, cutting off uh, any avenues that there might be for the, the FARC to speak to national and international publics, uh, that's going to come back on, on the military and uh, the government to a certain extent. Now it becomes a, a, a battle of ideas. The playing field is still uneven, but uh, you know, the FARC now is, is being advised, I, I hear, by the image consultants of uh, uh, the PT party in Brazil, whether that Lula and Husef's people, they have uh, people who go off to Argentina and get masters in communication and come back. So uh, this kind of image war continues. Hmm. Could you speculate a bit as to why um, the other Alex uh, suffered f uh, with his visions of the devil and so forth. Do you think it's at all possible that many um, combatants, killers, uh, feel any pangs of remorse? Or is that phrase itself uh, uh, ludicrous, that there's something, some other uh, cause for this uh, um, nightmare? I, it, it clearly weighs on, on their conscience. Uh, and the people that I've spoken to, um, it, it weighs heavily on, on their conscience. And it, interestingly, it, it, it comes out w with these kind of psychotropic encounters. Um, psychotropic? Psychotropic. Oh, psycho. uh, you know, the, the government has psychological workshops or whatever, um, but they're really quite, um, they're just ticking boxes. Uh, the real kind of, confrontation with, with one's demons tends to be provoked by Jahe. Uh, and, and that's something I'd, I'd love to hear more about uh, from you in terms of thinking about this, this issue. Um, here, the, the devil arrives at the moment in which he wants to uh, stop working with a pistol, so to speak. Oh, I didn't catch that. Yeah, I mean, it, it's not ex it, it, very explicit, but he wants uh, to be transferred to a different unit. He doesn't want to be, uh, quote-unquote, working with the pistol, as he, as he says. And the devil is saying to him that essentially he can't, that he needs to continue to work with the pistol. Um, and he's, he's tortured by this devil for, for two months. And it's not until um, he leaves and he speaks with his cousin, who's a, who's a shaman, uh, that he gets treatment uh, and gets the explanation as to why he's having these dreams with the devil. He says, they'll train you with a pistol, and it's not to do any good. Um, do, do you think there's a possibility that... Uh, if I'm, uh, I'm making some assumptions here, that to work with a pistol means an individual assassin versus being part of a, a collective which engages in battle. But it's a different thing to be an individual who walks down Broadway and is supposed to kill an informant 
versus a group that is engaged as a group uh, is that uh, it's so individualized and also the uh, family and friends of the um, person killed are going to try very hard uh, to find you. Uh, is, there, is anything like that uh, echo? I mean, I'm trying to think why, why this engagement with the, uh, the uh, sim ultimate symbol of evil, the devil, occurs when he's trying to give up that role as a, I call it a, a pistolero. I don't know if it's correct. Yeah. It's a conjecture. Yeah, I, what I'll say is um, yeah, killing with the pistol um, is much more personal. You know, if you, mm. if you, if you kill somebody in combat, um, you might not know, ever, you might never know that you, you did. Um, so I suspect you're not off base. This is uh, uh, amongst the newer who was studied by um, a legendary anthropologist, E. E. Evans Pritchard in the 30s. Uh, homicide between warriors is such that the killer is inflicted with the spirit of the person killed and becomes taboo and becomes sick, may die, uh, and has to undergo all sorts of very special treatments. Uh, uh, Eduardo Viveros de Castro talks about his field work in central Brazil, same thing, only the spirit of the victim is in your body forever, forever. It teaches you to dance, sleeps with your wife, and so on. Um, when um, an anthropologist named of Hutchinson went to study the Noor in the 80s, she discovered that the situation had changed because they no longer killed with a spear, but with a gun. And it was then said that this, uh, the spirit of the victim does not necessarily come into your own body because it's impersonal. Uh, but with a spear, with a direct sort of physical link. So we're just sort of working... Uh, it's the similar logic, I think, that you were just uh, pointing out when you said, well, a pistol is much more personal than in, uh, in a combat. But this notion of the spirit of the dead person coming into your own body, uh, it's not something that I've ever heard uh, in, in Colombia stated like that. Um, the newer are very uh, tribes people, the people Viveros de Castro worked with, uh, are tribal Indians. We're talking of a different situation, but still the analogy, uh, oh, there's an, an analogy that could be made with a lot of modification, right? Yeah, absolutely. And despite the fact this is a, an experimental documentary, uh, we are appropriating um, Hollywood tropes. I mean, there, there is, uh, I mean, Joseph Campbell, the, the folklorist, has the hero, you know, his uh, distillation of the hero's journey that then gets picked up in Hollywood screenwriting uh, by the screenwriter by the name of Vogler, who has like seven steps in the hero's journey, and, you know, he crosses the threshold, and he goes into the cave and confronts his deepest fear, and comes back a changed man, or something like that. It's something fairly formulaic. Um, and we decided to actually work with that a little bit and massage it uh, into not, not the classic three-part story, but a, a four-part story. Um, the youth, you know, the troubled youth, uh, the combat uh, travails, um, the inner conscious playing out uh, with the dream of the devil, um, the return home and the inability to really return home and being stuck in the city. Um, and this last part was, was important because unlike the FARC fighters who are leaving because of the peace agreement in 2016, the deserters um, found refuge in the cities because they were at a distance from, from their former comrades. I learned recently I was at the FARC's 10th conference in in Jari, in, in southern Colombia, and the FARC had, had issued an internal decree uh, saying that they wouldn't go after deserters who um, didn't damage the movement, that wouldn't be informing with the military. So really that threat in the late, in the, you know, in, in 2012, 13, 14, 
uh, went down. But still, there would be rumors uh, circulated by who knows mm -hmm. who to say that there was pis the pistol plan that uh, the deserters would be uh, tracked down and, and, and killed. Um, so this city, and originally, right now, the, the working title is Dreams from the Mountain. Um, previously, it was Dreams from the Concrete Mountain. And, and this is uh, a trope that returns in many of the narratives of the former combatants to say, you know, one war was in the jungle, one war was in the mountains, another is in, in the city. So here we're in that fourth chapter, we're alluding to the, the kind of harsh and uh, unforgiving city. But yeah, those, those poetic pieces are, are meant to evoke these four stages and, and also break up the journey because, as I said earlier, a novel as, as the, the truck is, the, it can get monotonous. They almost, they almost look like quotations. Yeah, and some, are, some are pulled. Mm -hmm. You know, there's so much academic writing on violence and the difficulty of representing it. Um, and I do think the kind of standard documentary um, comes up a bit short. Um, he criticized Joshua Oppenheimer, as you may. Um, the, I think it was a productive provocation. Uh, and I think through experimental methods, I think there's a better chance of uh, approximating the complexity and the depth that goes into either uh, experiencing violence as a victim or uh, getting into the perpetrator's mindset. Um, here, I'm, I'm trying to conjugate questions of form with the contents itself. That um, the space of the truck by recording, in, you know, by essentially being in the video camera itself, um, we're being, you know, we're, we're co-creating the movie. Uh, this isn't a, a, a neutral apparatus. Um, it's dark. Um, and it's in, it's in motion. And you don't know where we are. Uh, the subject doesn't know where we are. Um, we're in the, you know, barely walkie-talkie communication with the driver. The truck is locked from the outside. Um, that all of these elements, you know, I, I, I'm not sure that that devil dream, I, I had no idea that he had this dream with the devil. I, I knew him before, um, but I had no idea he had this dream with the devil. And uh, were it not for the apparatus of the truck, I don't think that story would have come out, and it, it wouldn't have come out in the same way. So I think experimental, I mean, I, it's not experimentation for experimentation's sake, but um, I think when it, it comes to thinking about how uh, form and content go together, I mean, I had, this was at the tail end of my doctoral research, so I had listened to uh, dozens, if not over a hundred narratives of former combatants, um, and I was thinking through those narratives as I was conceptualizing the project. So uh, the, short of the, the short of the answer is I, I think you're right. It is a bit of a trend. Uh, I think it's, it's a good thing. Any more? Going to make some more truck movies? Uh, I'm going to shoot more, more landscapes. So we, uh, to circle back to one of your first questions, we took an, I, I took an eight-day trip with a truck through northern Colombia um, just to shoot landscape shots. And uh, I think I'm going to do that again. Not eight days, but uh, go out and, and try to get more landscapes. Uh, maybe try to re-record the audio. Um, I want to do something with all the... I have an, a, a, a lot of other material, and I'd like to use it in, in a kind of installation and transmedia uh, way to uh, create a website, but also I'd love to do an art installation with the truck itself where people would climb into the truck and watch the film in the truck and really experience the kind of productive disorientation uh, of, of that. I mean, in a way,
way, each you've created a revolution in landscape photography. I was very inspired by Abelardo Morel. I don't know if anybody's come across his work. Yeah. Abelardo Morel. He's a, a Cuban photographer who uh, is Boston-based. And he's done some amazing work with the pinhole camera. Of course, you know, the pinhole camera predates photography. And it's, its allure is its simplicity. Um, and there's been all sorts of projects with pinhole cameras. Um, but what he does with the pinhole camera is, you know, transforming rooms and putting periscopes on tents and projecting onto the concrete uh, ground and creating these really textured images. I was just very much impressed. And I, I, my initial ambition was just to be a, a cheap knockoff of Abogardo Morel. Um, M-O-R-E-L. Yeah, uh, yeah, two L's. Um, but yeah, this video thing took me in a different direction. Well, it's the project's taking so long to cook. <laughs> it's, uh, um, I'm an academic and I'm a professor, and uh, the incentives being what they are, it means I had have had to put this on the back burner a little bit to get other projects out. But um, I just say that because the conditions in Colombia are changing. Um, you know, th there were 16,000 people who left the FARC between 2003 and 2016, Jeez. which is nearly double the amount that are leaving on account of the peace agreement. So, you know, I have a critique in my, in my academic work that I make ab about this program that's framed as a demobilization program, but it's really desertion in another guise. Uh, and essentially saying that they're demobilizing people to remobilize them uh, with the state forces and, and kind of casting them into these abject urban uh, environments where once they're broke and broken, um, they are tempted to remobilize with paramilitaries or criminal groups. And um, so, you know, th that critique has kind of become irrelevant. Uh, the, the more pressing concern, well, it's not entirely irrelevant. Uh, the program continues for the ELN. It's not dead, but it's been uh, very much surpassed uh, by the need to implement the peace agreement with the FARC. And so, you know, now the, the more pressing issue is uh, getting communities to accept former combatants uh, because nobody wants to have former combatants as neighbors. Um, you know, there's been decades of propaganda, as, as Mick uh, referred to earlier. And so, you know, how, how can you begin to humanize these people? And, and I think dreams is, is a good place to start because we all dream, right? I run in a, a circle of people on the, the democratic left that uh, are in this group called Ihos, which are sons and daughters for... Uh, mostly of political violence that was perpetrated in the 1980s. Uh, and they've, they've seen it, um, but they're, they're not really victims of, of the FARC. They're really uh, victims of the right. So the short answer to your question is no, victims of the FARC have not seen this film yet, and that will be uh, a very interesting screening to do at some point. Uh, tying it in with the previous question, you know, I think this can contribute to a, a discussion about... Um, about truth and reconciliation. Um, I'd like to take the truck on the road and uh, put a white sheet on one side of the truck and project the film in, in villages and use it as a discussion piece, uh, possibly with you know, transitional justice NGOs. Um, but that's all, those are all possibilities. First, I wanna lock in the, the documentary short and get that circulating. How did I just focus on Alex? Well, why did I do that? Um, it was unwieldy. I was, having, I was having real editing problems in doing the other. Um, so it, it became a, a question of simplifying. Uh, there's a lot going on with the truck and then different narratives and different people and suturing them together was a, an editorial task that was beyond my, my abilities. Um, and I, I intend to use that footage, but 
I think for a short documentary uh, focusing on Alex will, will will make it more digestible and hopefully impactful. I've been quite critical of war photojournalism uh, and just the professional practice of war photojournalism. I think we get wonderful images that are important. I, I don't want to be too dismissive. Um, but what's been interesting to see is since the peace process is a lot of these war photojournalists have been working on side projects all the while and have been kind of keeping them in a box on the side and they're starting to, uh, to share them. And I think that you have extraordinarily talented uh, photographers of all nationalities in Colombia. Um, and now what we're seeing is a lot of photographic collectives popping up. And so you have uh, Fabrica Visual Ojo Rojo, which is a co collective of, of five photographers that has a curatorial project. Um, you have uh, Native Agency, which is a kind of international collective of photographers who come uh, from places like Caqueta. Um, really, there's a lot of extraordinary work being done. I'd be happy to go through lists of names. I mean, certain, certain people get a lot more attention the other, than others. Federico Rios is somebody who's been doing photo essays for the New York Times and has, has beautiful work. Um, but the old generation of, of Jesus Abad Colorado and Stephen Ferry, you know, they're still working, um, but there's a real um, you know, explosion of, of youthful talent. And I think the conditions of the peace process, process is really helping that. One thing is to talk about um, uh, technique, uh, beautiful photographs and so on, but going back to the question from someone at the back, my hearing is not that great, so I didn't pick it up, but it, it seems to me the key question for um, war photography and war writing is uh, to face the problem of, um, of uh, uh, how, to re how to talk about violence, how to picture uh, violence without making it worse, and without feeding all sorts of uh, uh, sort of sick uh, uh, fascinations that we all we all have uh, about sadism and aggression and 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 so on, and it seemed to me that your film was, uh, and I think this was the questioner's um, uh, point. Your film um, does uh, confront violence indirectly uh, through various means the man's story, the man's face, the shifting landscape, the strangeness of the situation. And it's one thing to say, represent violence indirectly, but of course it's the nature of that indirection that's so hard to uh, attain or describe or feel your way into. And I think this, this is a huge contribution. I mean, one of the things, um happy with in the, his recounting of the dream is, you know, he, he clearly sets his limit and says, you know, I'll say, you know, I worked, worked with a pistol and you're kind of left there. Um, it doesn't get into these kind of gr graphic uh, stories, um, which I think would be to the detriment of, it, of, of everything. Um, and in watching his face as he says that, um, we get a sense of the weight uh, of, of the stories, even though we don't know what they are. And uh, that to me is, uh, I think works in this instance. Um, and I think oftentimes uh, what goes unsaid um, exactly. can be much more powerful than yeah. what is laid out explicitly. I just want to repeat uh, something was said at the beginning, which is the synergy, the the parallelism, the um, uh, passage of energy between the moving truck and the landscape and the ma and the actual narration is astonishing. I mean, it's something I keep I'll keep thinking about a lot. But it's it's I've never seen it before, where there's a a storyteller has got you sort of hooked. There's a, let's say there's three or four or five stories actually in what, uh, in what we just saw. Uh, but the fact that this um, reverberates 
with the moving track, with the sound of the moving track, with the changing landscapes, which are completely uh, asynchronous with what the man is saying. You know, you might be seeing uh, uh, city, city dwellings, you may be seeing mountains, you may be seeing cows in a pasture, you may be seeing palm trees, and, and, and there's this life unraveling, uh, the landscape unravels. Uh, I, I, I think it's extraordinary. Uh, and I think the audio editing is going to be crucial. Uh, we, you know, as you can hear, there's not much audio editing here. And again, apologies for the, the fact that for some reason the audio was dropping out in moments. But um, I think if we really get the audio editing right, that's going to help. The movement of the track. Yeah. And, and t but tying that in with the story, like a, a very conscientious sound design uh, that enables, <laughs> you, know, you know, the trucks gr groaning to, to kind of shift in with the story. Let me negate, let me uh, uh, upset what I just said. I mean, there must be a huge number of films that have been made since 1900 uh, about trains and things that happen in trains. And there are some very famous ones. Uh, Hitchcock, The Lady Vanishes, uh, for example, that goes on and on. So there you have a sort of a, it's not a, but it's not a narration. It's not like this focus on one person talking in a, almost like... A, Mm, a very stoic, very stoic manner, you know. But still, the notion of the of the train, or the in this case the truck moving, and the story being told, you know, that's a that's an old this is an old trope. So I, I want to sort of fit that observation in with what I find so novel about what you've done. Yeah, I mean, this is it. Kind of can evoke a man with a movie camera going back all the way to Vertov, right? I mean, the City Symphony films and. For, for me, you know, the question of the city loomed larger earlier in the project, but uh, again, uh, yeah, thinking about these f former combatants, the camouflage themselves in the city, um, and moving through the city furtively and conducting this interview in a way that nobody could tell. Um, when I did the eight-day trip around Colombia in the truck, then we got stopped by the police on a few occasions, and the police would open up, and then it would be like, what? And, and, you know, they had no idea, and we would break out letters from like Harvard or Los Andes, and they'd be like, whatever, whatever, just keep going. Um, but it's something about um, the movement, and, and particularly for me in the beginning, was this, the question of moving through the city. You know, how do you, how do you move through the city? Uh, how, do these, how are these stories surrounding us? Uh, how are they surrounding us? And how are we uh, not confronted with them? Uh, and then to the contrary, you know, now as a, as a spectator, you are locked in the truck with us. One of the ideas was to reveal the apparatus gradually to try to maintain attention about where we are and the kind of productive disorientation. So by having the kind of bouncing around the pinhole in the beginning, we're kind of foreshadowing a, a reveal towards the end where, you know, we'll see the pin, you know, the different parts of the, the truck. Um, but yeah, at, at, there's so much more to do at the same time. I'm somewhat unsatisfied with some of the footage and, uh, which is why I want to shoot some more in, in January. And we had two cameras back there. I want to throw three cameras back there and, and really kind of, um, uh, Play even more with what with what you're talking about. How my relationship with Alex has developed over time. Um, it's gotten more intense. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm, you know, in, in continual contact with him. He broke his leg I, I, while on a motorcycle trip in Ecuador. I, I tried to be supportive uh, through that. Uh, it's. It's harder now that he's uh, no longer in Bogota, but uh, we're we're continually uh, in touch. And I met his family, and um, you know it, it's it's growing. Um, I, there's this strange coincidence that we're both Alex as, <laughs> as, as well, which is you know. Tokayo. Yeah, me Tokayo. Um, but uh, you know he's he's a problematic character. He's a complex character. But I, I I love the fact that he has a real sense of humor that comes across uh, when he says, you know, I barely know how to eat that stuff. You know, he uh, he, he has the kind of deadpan style and and kind of uh, understated 
charisma and storytelling uh, that I'm very much drawn to. Uh, uh, made me uh, remember a question I wanted to ask, uh, which is uh, how stu- uh, 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 the wording is clumsy. How indigenous is he? He says at the beginning that he was uh, living in an indigenous community. I think that's the term. Um, and hence his relationships with uh, Indian curers and so forth could be uh, should be seen through that lens. But most of the, st- the stories he told, he, did, he didn't seem to, at all involved in anything uh, indigenous. I think he's nominally from an indigenous community, mm-hmm. but uh, hasn't identified with it. Um, he has cousins who are steeped in it and very much in the middle of it. And he, you know, he has close relationships with people who are very much uh, part of the Indi- uh, indigenous community. Uh, he himself has a very uh, kind of hot and cold relationship uh, with his own sense of indigeneity. Uh, I had been conducting research for a long time. I had been working uh, with one of his co- cousins who was a, an organizer, uh, organizing some of the, the former combatants um, to try to improve their conditions. Um, So I I met him initially through a cousin of his. This this is a sort of dumb question. Can you imagine any, uh, doing any film work about the um, paramilitaries? Uh, The people who follow Uribe, the people who want to destroy uh, the FARC, uh, and so on and so forth. Isn't this a compelling political necessity at this point? I, yeah. I mean, this would be the, the act of killing parallel, right? Uh, and, and when I met Joshua Oppenheimer and uh, I told him about this project, he says, well, wh- why aren't you studying the, pa- why are you going to do a film about the paramilitaries? Yeah. Um, which you can. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm sure there are many people who are doing <laughs> films on the paramilitaries. I, I, uh, I'm happy to keep a little bit of distance, um, but it's important. It's important work, um, and raising the same types of issues about how to portray violence, but in an even more difficult and urgent register, because oftentimes the type of violence that the paramilitaries uh, inflict is uh, even more uh, gruesome. And so it makes the challenge of representing it all the more difficult. Um, There's a book I don't know too well by a guy called Aldo Civico, who taught here in the city and in Rutgers. And he worked uh, in Sicily when the uh, mafia uh, violence was at its height and then went to Colombia. And he has a book out. And he told me that he uh, the book is based on um, intensive, uh, I'd say, knowledge and in interviews with leading paramilitaries, and he cl- he worked a lot with dreams. I haven't, I, to my shame, I haven't read the book. I think it's probably very important. But uh, there's there's a lot of dream work in there as well. Do you know the book? Uh, the one he recently published. Oh, yeah, and I, I started it. Mm-hmm. I started it, and I know he was uh, interviewing some of the paramilitary leaders. Um, there was. Uh, Mitter Meyer's book on uh, dreams that matter, uh, dream interpretation in, in Egypt. Uh, you know, dreams has a long history in, in anthropology. Um, and I started writing a piece thinking about um, different theories of dreams and how they may or may not be helpful to the types of dream stories that I would hear from these former combatants because they seem to on the one hand, um, you know, mix a kind of Freudian analysis, which is all about depth, right? You know, penetrating deep into some you know, deeper consciousness that's uh, hidden um, from oneself. And also, uh, you know, Gilles Deleuze, when, when he writes about his critiques of Freud, when he talks about um, a more cartographic, uh, understanding and, and a line of flight where it's it's all about kind of creative escapes um, and I was trying to write something that would uh, try to reconcile these two uh, 
two visions of subjectivity and to say, you know, despite the fact that Deleuze is trying to kill the Freudian father of Freud himself, uh, he is really, uh, it's, it's an opposition that's for per, mostly a, a performance and that if, if we take away the opposition and we look at, we look at these two as, as complementary, um, you know, and, and particularly through the case of the former combatants, that their narratives might um, provide us some theor theoretical language that emerges from the ethnography um, that kind of breaks the theory in a way, that, that breaks the incompatibility between theories. Um, so I, I feel like I need to do more work with dreams, and I... <laughs> I I'm writing this book, and I ended up taking it out of the book because it was just too, yeah, yeah, yeah. too unwieldy. Um, but it's something I need to continue to uh, think about and hopefully tackle in writing uh, soon. First, on the indigenous piece, what is fascinating is you know the front that he spends the most time in is the 48th front. The 48th front is composed overwhelmingly of, of different indigenous communities. And this policy of taking people out individually um, has had devastating effect on the communities because you have so many indigenous people who are in the ranks, uh, particularly in the southern fronts, um, that when somebody leaves, there are reprisals. Uh, and the reprisals, if they're not against the person who, was, uh, who defected, they could potentially be against the family. And this has, uh, this has meant that indigenous communities uh, have been very badly affected. Um, that as the war of intelligence, uh, because essentially what the, the ultimate utility of the deserters to the Colombian state is the intelligence that they provide. And so as the war becomes increasingly a war of intelligence, it is... Um, taken out on the social fabric, and it's taken out uh, particularly on the social fabric of the indigenous communities. Um, so, you know, you're referencing the, the kind of presence of uh, indigeneity as a theme in the film, but they're very, there's a, uh, another focus on, you know, indigeneity and, and the conflict, right, that this, this only gestures towards. On the question of psychoanalysis and wanting to kill his stepfather, uh, feeling emasculated without the rifle, and the rifle is his god, and he's now dealing with not having his what was his god, and but comes out and has a son. Right? It, it all seems very you know ripe for psychoanalytic <laughs> piece of analytic work. Um, beyond that ripeness, I I don't know what to say. I mean, as people are uh, letting their guns down, I mean they're there is a real identity crisis. Uh, I had friends who went to the ultimate, the last disarmament of the FARC in, just a year ago, and it, they said the people were crying when, when they had to hand in their weapons. You know, if they were assaulted and hit the ground, they would go with their, they would grab their weapon first. And there was one story where this, this, this guy says, uh, the girlfriend, didn't follow the ground with her weapon soon enough and she was killed, right? So this is built into the habitus of, of guerrilla life in the sense of emasculation, both for the men, but you know, for the women as well. Um, I, I don't know what to say. It exceeds my capacity to interpret, but it is deeply uh, analytical. Well, I think the, the devil dream does that work? I mean, it's it's not all about a, a kind of psychoanalytic reckoning, but um, by having the devil dream occupy literally the middle of the cut, you know, it comes in at about 15 minutes on a 29 minute piece. Um, it is the kind of centerpiece of the film, and um, the questions of of who is the devil? Why is the devil there? Why is the devil coming to him at this moment? Why is he trying to fight the devil? Um, why is he trying to fight the devil with um, silver bullets? Um, I, th I think that one story does a good job of uh, gesturing 
to both the indigenous issue and, and the kind of psychoanalytic issue. In the course of the interview, I didn't really want to interrupt his flow, um, though I do a ask what was the interpretation uh, on the part of the shamans, because they said, well, they, they told me what, th what this was about. I wasn't going to let that slide. I said, well, what, what, what was it about? And that's where he says, well, it was the pistol. And, and, um, I never asked about the why silver bullets, uh, but I'm going to. <laughs> um, but I, I did ask about um, more about the context, and that's where it came out that the timing of these dreams was when he wanted to leave, um, stop working with the pistol. So it, it's, it's not really said in the film, um, which is fine. But um, to me, that was the key piece. Uh, but yeah, I need to continue to ask. Should we call it a day and thank Alex very much and the other Alex as well? Right. Thank you. Thank you.